my mind is just exploding when you're talking about all this stuff and just how much additional work and time and energy that is on your plate right now to try to deal with all of these things that in any normal season, you wouldn't have to spend one second on and you'd be doing other things and attending to yeah. other tasks. But with all this stuff on there, on your plate, it, it has to be difficult to just try to get the normal routine stuff done that you would normally be doing on a day-to-day and month-to-month basis. Yeah, it, it's, it's obviously all changed. And, you know, we're, you know, we're focused on our teams and our, and our, 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 our basketball teams and our testing and the health and safety of our teams. And then, you know, we want to, you know, uh, be as opportunistic and safe as we can in the arena. You know, we want uh, to do, we want fans, we want to be able to, to, um, you know, have an environment. We got to do that safely, carefully, you know, all within the context of, of, of local uh, health conditions. And then also just with, with our university. So kind of schedule has to hit. I mean, I've never, you know, been in a situation where we are right now. I mean, our, our schedule, I think is shaping up um, well, and when the, when this, uh, very well, when this, when the schedule shapes up and we have dates and we've got that settled, then we'll begin to execute, you know, how we would potentially distribute tickets under a variance. Yeah, I don't want and to that is, that a second. yeah, yes. yeah, it, it's literally occurring all day, every day, every, every night till midnight, every morning from 6am to midnight, Saturday, Sunday, uh, that is this entire process from scheduling and then, and then working on you know, how to position ourselves um, for some type of variance. Before we get to scheduling, it's just, are there any out of the box ideas, you know, can, considering the, the, the attendance restrictions that are going to be in place, most people, at least at the beginning, aren't going to be at the arena watching basketball. Are there any other ideas that you've been throwing around to try to somehow bring basketball to the masses so we can watch it, either if it's some additional streaming or some other things? I mean, have you thought about any of that stuff? Yeah, you know, we, we, we have. I think the, the, you know, right now our, our, you know, our media rights are pretty well spoken for within the league and within the A-10. So we've, we've, we've worked with, you know, our television partners, Fox Sports, Ohio, Spectrum. And of course, um, you know, we're not on HIO uh, TV anymore, but we're still partners with them with, with radio. So we've had conversations about how that can look and really trying to just maximize the television exposure, maximize that viewership. You know, the games that are not picked up on TV, obviously be part of the ESPN Plus package that is available worldwide. You know, we obviously prefer to be on TV and be simulcast on streaming. You know, we try to avoid streaming only. But, you know, Spectrum, Fox Sports, our national television partners, I think the quality of our games and the quality of our team will continue to lead to, to national television opportunities. So, you know, if we, if we position all these things together, you know, I'm, I'm confident that people will be able to watch – you know, the flyers, when we get into some of the creative things that we've stuff, we've discussed all those, you talk about, you know, behind the scenes cameras and, you know, stuff to kind of change the experience. You just start to run into, um, you know, closer contact and interaction with the team, which we're trying to avoid. And then you get into, you know, I've had people say, why don't you just set up multiple cameras in different places? And it's like, well, that's what the media rights are. They, they, they pay for the opportunity to, to broadcast those games. So I can't broadcast them on a, on a separate channel. Those belong to ESPN, CBS, Fox Sports, Ohio. So you can't kind of have a bootlegged camera, you know, uh, tracking something else. So, you know, we're, we're working on a couple of things, but ultimately it's going to be, you know, the, the television and an ESPN plus, which I think will be the, 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 the predominant way. Okay, so let's get to let's get to scheduling. You've been a busy man over the last week or two, obviously over the last six months to try to put a schedule together, but a lot of things have happened in the last week or two. My understanding is the Myrtle Beach tournament that we were uh, scheduled to head to, that's pretty much out, and that's been replaced by the Sioux Falls, South Dakota tournament, which is at the Pentagon Complex, which my understanding is it's basically – the battle for Atlantis field minus Duke and we're replacing Duke. Is that right? Yes, that is correct. So they just uh, announced that this week, that, you know, that's official. Uh, you know, they, they've, they've, they've come out with that and, you know, we will be, you know, we've replaced Duke in that uh, field. It's um, won't get into the, to the nuance of it, but you know, it's essentially a, a, a new tournament that was created that all those teams ended up, you know, deciding to join. It's a, it's a really loaded field. Um, and, you know, we start uh, – that will be the, the kickoff to the season if all goes well. So that will be November 25th, 26th, 27th. Yeah, for so those, that's who, uh, field. those who don't know what the, uh, the, the field looks like, it's uh, West Virginia, Ohio State, Creighton, 
Memphis, Utah, Wichita, and a &M. So that's, that's, those are some, it's probably a better tournament than the Myrtle tournament, actually. Yeah, you know, our, I mean, our, we use some analytics to project teams. I mean, we think there's, you know, at least three or four top 20 teams in there. Um, that gives us an opportunity to start the season, um, you know, right away. The, the college basketball will tip off with that, with that tournament. Um, it will be, you know, that's the stage that, that's the stage that we want. You know, of course, I think if you talk to all the coaches in that in that tournament, they love to be able to play a game or two before, you know, running into that field. But that's where we find ourselves. And you know, ultimately, uh, we're really big partners with ESPN and, and our tournament in Myrtle Beach that has moved to Orlando. And um, we're with uh, ESPN owns the tournaments that we're in in Charleston and Myrtle Beach, Orlando, Anaheim. And they're wonderful partners. Just in this situation, you know, I felt like, you know, the the the, the, the everything that was shifting so fast and the opportunity to take some certainty or as close as to certainty as you can get with a field that's built that, you know, uh, needed a, a, a single, you know, a single replacement um, was an opportunity that was just good for the program in totality. And so that, that's what we'll kick off. We'll kick off college basketball really um, um, with, you know, we, we had a previous agreement with SMU to be at home right now. That is still um, uh, holding tight. SMU wants to come here. We want to have them come here. Uh, Ole Miss was originally scheduled to be in Chicago, a neutral game back in May. Believe it or not, I, I think the people in Chicago must have foreseen some of these situations, and and they decided to to uh, knew they had to cancel that tournament at the United Center based on fans. And so we worked with Ole Miss and say, could we turn this into a home and home and actually starting at at UD? So you know, on one hand, we're really fortunate and blessed to be able to have SMU and Ole Miss come in here mixed with the Sioux Falls tournament. The at the same time, you know, you wish it was front of a full house. Like, it, you know, we try to get so hard to get those games. You finally get them. You get them starting at home. And, you know, as only luck would have it, um, you know, seemingly under some under attendance restrictions. Uh, the A-10 Mount West Challenge has, has been postponed, you know, for a variety of reasons. So, and, and we're still, uh, right now, Mississippi State still wants to, to play. And we'll play Mississippi State in Atlanta on December 12th as part of a, a – a, a series of games, which will be a good opportunity for us. And, and I think both uh, depending upon how the pandemic goes, um, there could be an opportunity for fans, limited number of fans, both in Atlanta and in Sioux Falls, um, if, if, if things play out right. So maybe even more than, than, than here. So, and then we got a couple other games to mix in there, but right now we're at trying to get those dates solidified, get the logistics solidified of, of everything from testing, you know, COVID testing and the teams, but if right now, if we're able to, if, if Sioux Falls, you know, we're able, is that able to go off without a hitch? We're able to play SMU, able to play Mississippi State, and able to play Ole Miss. That's six out of eight or nine non-conference games. And so um, that, I, I think, is as good as you can do. I mean, that's, 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 there may not be a lot of teams that are able to pull that off, um, you know, that, that quality and given the situation. And then obviously the challenge is, you know, you, you got you to gotta go play the games. But I think we, we've positioned it to have an opportunity to demonstrate, you know, our, our team's ability, um, at least in the old world of, of net and, and RPI and metrics um, would say you should. Yeah, I think when you, when you look at things over the last several weeks, I mean, Dayton, the, the job that you guys have done, putting together a schedule, uh, I think we're going to come out as well or better than most schools actually who are in sort of UD sphere. But just from like a 30,000 foot view standpoint, you know, the season's going to start almost a month later than it normally does. And so when you look at other schools, maybe the, the Richmond's or the Rhode Island's or um, just other schools and other leagues that are sort of fighting for those at-large bids that aren't necessarily in the power six conferences, you know, they may not be as fortunate as Dayton as far as getting these non-conference games and, and exempt tournaments. And now that their non-conference season has been chopped probably at least in half they've got fewer marquee games to try to go out and get so they're they're pigeonholed into a place where they can't get um good net wins they can't get good quad one wins they're probably not going to get them in their conference where at the same time you've got your duke and north carolinas and michigans and ohio states and uclas are looking and saying who cares if we even play the non-conference season we've got 10 or 12 or 14 quad one games in our league every year we don't even need to worry about it. So do you see the NCAA at least recognizing that when it comes bracket time and realizing that 
if the deck wasn't stacked slightly against the little guy before, it probably is even more so now. It's a good question. I, and I, I don't know, because I think on one hand, you know, I, I certainly understand and, and, you know, people, there's committees that decided, um, you know, the, the start dates of, of college basketball and I'm not going to uh, armchair, you know, quarterback it, but you know, you had a 15 delay from the 10th to the 15th. So it just sounds like two weeks, but it actually has colossal impact. Um, like for us, I mean, you know, we lost six games, five or six games in that window. And, you know, we are fortunate enough through some relationships and the quality of our team that we had some options to, to try to make some of those games up. Um, but, you know, some of that's a little bit luck and some of that's a little bit, um, you know, the, the status of our program, but both those things go together. But it's a very trying time to demonstrate your ability in the non-conference uh, right now because there's a domino effect to every decision. So someone says, hey, it's just the season's just starting two weeks later. Well, it, it, that two weeks, you, you might as well have canceled two months in terms of from a scheduling perspective. So, you know, I wasn't sure how much two weeks did in terms of making COVID better. Is 15 days COVID going to be in a better situation? I don't know. Um, I'll trust the people that made that decision and try not to, to second guess that. But you have a little bit of a move that has this much of an impact. And so, but you know, we were preparing for that really since July to try to have opportunities and be positioned that if there was just upheaval, and, and, and chaos out there in the scheduling world, which there is, by the way. And I, th I, think, I think some people underestimated the, the chaos that would result and has resulted. Uh, so I, I just don't know how the selection committee, you know, I've kind of posed the question and people say, well, when do you want the season to start and who do you want to play? And I said, tell me the rules of the race and I'll give you my answer. You know, tell me what the rules of engagement are. Are you going to, you focus on quad one, you focus on quad two, you focused on net, are you focused on, uh, you tell me what the end goal is and I'll tell you what I think we should do. You know, we didn't really get that. You know, the selection committee didn't come out and say, hey, here's what we want you to do. So all we can do is say, look, over time, we believe the selection committee rewards teams that demonstrate that they can beat other NCAA tournament caliber teams. And so that's, that's our strategy. And we'll see, we'll see how it shakes out. Um, certainly we'll expect some disruption with games. Um, you know, somewhere along the way, whether that's in the A-10 or outside. But, you know, I, it's hard, but I think I have to try to trust the selection committee to kind of evaluate all that. And, you know, that, that's hard for me to do uh, sometimes. But I, I think in this year, it's going to be just imperfect. And we got to try to just make position ourselves that no one needs a lot of judgment on the Flyers. And I know that's what Anthony's goal is. Easier said than done. It's easy for the athletic director to say that. But to just you know, try to make things um, as less debate as needs to be for for flyers, and, and same for women's basketball with with Shauna. Do you see the 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 2021 NCAA tournament as is as we've always known it? Or do you see any wrinkles there? Or it, the size, the field size, probably going to be the same. Or the venue is going to be any different? Um, you've got net metrics that you know again, kind of with RPI and net. I know the RPI is dead, but you know, a lot of these things are contingent upon these metrics interconnecting with one another to get a connected field of data. And so you got a smaller field of data, all this other stuff going on. Is it, are they pretty much just going to leave everything alone or do you see any wrinkles? Yeah, I think, you know, Dan Gavitt has said the intention is to have the NCAA tournament as a full field, all 68 teams and the sites that are currently selected. You know, I'm not privy to the contingency plans. I would believe that, that they are doing some level, the level of due diligence for those contingency plans, whatever that would be. So I do sense that there's going to have to be some wrinkles because if you don't have a certain number of non-conference games, in my opinion, and I think some other people who are smarter than me, the net becomes less less relevant because yeah. you have less cross-pollination of games. Sure. There are some other metrics that can hold up the Ken Palms of the world that maybe can adjust for that. And then – you know, in our case, you really focus on opportunity for quad one and quad two games, which has become a, a major, major uh, issue as part of selection. So, you know, if a, if a really good team just doesn't have the chance to demonstrate that because they just are not able to get those level of quality games or, you know, say with the six games that we have that are really challenging good games, if a certain number of them get interrupted, disrupted, COVID, travel, state regulations, what have you, you know, you kind of want to say, hey, you know, I could have, I had the opportunity to do this. Um, and so 
I think there's going to have to be some contingency planning. I'm glad I'm, you know, uh, not on the selection committee uh, any year, but certainly this year because uh, they're going to have to work cut out for them. And I, I do wish there was a way, and there's a couple of models out there, but I do wish there was a way where at least the membership could understand what the rules of engagement are, what the committee is going to value, um, if it's going to be like it has been in years past. So I've kind of been pushing for that because um, at Dayton, we kind of say, you tell us the rules. It's our job to figure out the, the puzzle. Um, it's a little bit harder when you're like, gosh, I'm not sure exactly how, how the rules are going to work. So we're going to operate under previous guidance, which is um, beat the best teams you can as bad as you can. And, and that's, 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 that's kind of scheduling 101, uh, beat, beat the best teams and beat them bad. Just switching gears a little bit as we start to wrap this up, um, there's been a lot of talk about this whole age, or excuse me, this image likeness and name thing with the NCAA and paying players and student athletes. And, you know, it's been going on for several years. I don't know if this is the Ed O'Bannon thing that sort of started this whole thing, but as an athletic director, where do you sort of see this going? I mean, is it, um, is it something where it's, it's the football schools are basically steering this bus and wherever they go, everyone else has to follow? Or is there going to be some latitude involved in this? Who's really the prime mover? Is everybody else following those prime movers? Or how do you see it playing out in, in terms of UD? And is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing? Are you indifferent about it? What, what are your thoughts? Yeah, so I mean, it, the, the name image like this, I mean, it's coming. It's, it's here. It's not an execution format. But I think you have both NCA initiatives and then you've, you frankly have Congress in about 22 or 25 states that have enacted legislation that support name image likeness. So, you know, we're going to dive into it. Um, I think Dayton's actually well positioned to, 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 you know, we talk about, when we talk to recruits, we talk about their, their academics, their athletic and their personal growth, right? We want those three things. And, and really, you know, we're adding a fourth dimension, which is, you know, essentially maximizing their opportunity, maximizing their brand, maximizing their opportunity to, to use Dayton as a platform to have some opportunities to do some unique and interesting things in the space of whether that's, um, you know, endorsements or whether that's in the space of just their own camps and clinics. I mean, you could imagine, you know, Obi Toppin running a camp, you know, and, and, you know, at, at Trotwood high school or, you know, what have you. And so, you know, we think that at Dayton, we're going to be well positioned. I think we've been a little bit ahead of the curve and, in, in you know, our, 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 our social media, our social media team is really, really good. And when we actually you know, talk to recruits and we talk to players and our current players about the growth of their brand, our ability to be on national TV. So it's, it's common. It's a little bit um, unnerving that no one knows what the future, what the future looks like. But I think Dayton being uh, in this, in the town we're in, the fan base we have with the, the support that we have, that we'll be able, our players will have a platform to elevate themselves, which is what they all want to do. And you know, I think the NCAA is going to be pretty clear and Congress is going to be pretty clear that schools won't have influence in that. So we're not going to be negotiating deals on behalf of student athletes or wink, wink, trying to get people to do that. Um, they've got to do that on their own with their own representation. But what, what we can do is provide them education and provide them a platform of how they can build themselves. And it's not just for basketball. I mean, it's, it's for the soccer player that can have a camp in their hometown. It's for uh, the baseball player that can do a speaking engagement and get a couple bucks and what have you, all the things that weren't allowed before. So I'd be lying if I said there's not a little trepidation about what, you know, where this goes and what are the unintended consequences yeah. in concept. It, it, are we supportive of people uh, having the opportunity to monetize their name image likeness in a responsible way that doesn't completely blow up, uh, you know, college sports as we know it? Yes. I think the key question is what are those other unintended consequences, but Dayton's going to be right there. I think we'll be kind of on the leading edge. I think we are already with, with the, some things that we are able to, to offer and um, we'll just take it as it comes. I think UD is in a, in, in a pretty good position to compare compared to a lot of other schools. And as, like you said, as long as you just, you know, you're doing it for the right reasons and you got your ducks in the row and you avoid the moral hazards, I think there's certainly a way to navigate through all this and make it beneficial, not just for the athletic department, but also the student athletes as well. So I, I'm not too worried about from UD's standpoint, it, it, it could be an issue maybe for the, you know, the small schools that don't have huge budgets or don't have large platforms or yeah. the infrastructure to, to handle that sort of thing. But uh, I feel pretty confident that Dayton is uh, going to be in a good spot there. Um, 
just final thoughts before I let you go. Where do you see things in the next six months? Where are we going to be in six months from now? And is there anything that fans can do from our end to sort of make your job easier, make your life easier, the athletic department's life easier? What can we do to help you out so this can be a team effort? Yeah, you know, well, well for, I, I appreciate the question. First, I, I want to say, like, you know, you and other fans already do. We're blessed, and I'll never – I don't take a single season ticket holder or a single uh, fan for granted. Uh, the, the, the loyalty that's not just when, you know, on a year where you're, you know, 18-0 uh, and 0 in your league. I mean, it, it's been this way long before Neil Sullivan, uh, long before Anthony Grant. And it's, it's something that, that no one on our staff takes lightly from the front row of the arena to the very last row of the arena. So, you know, what, what fans do for us right now, um, I, you know, I try to flip the question, what, what, you know, I try and do things, things for them. Um, but I, I think the best thing that we can do together is just, you know, kind of understand there's going to be some imperfection, understand that we're under, uh, you know, some extreme pressure around uh, what attendance would look like at the arena and that there's, there's, a, there's a lot of math and a lot of logistics that, that are going to go into that. Um, we did a season ticket holder survey. We had a 70% response rate, which is just a remarkable of season ticket holders that allow us to help us build this model and what this looks like. So I think, you know, um, give, us, give us a chance to, to partner and give us a chance to see if we can muddy through this. Um, if, if people are in a position to um, support beyond their arena seating contribution, you know, certainly that would benefit directly to our student athletes. You know, uh, there's no one, you know, it's not going to administrative bloat and, and, you know, people, people like me, that's a direct benefit to our student athletes, 100%. And, and that's what we're really after. Their scholarships are still have to be honored. Their, you know, their, their healthcare, their practice, their travel is going to be more expensive as part of that. So I think just if fans keep doing what they do, that's, that's all I can ask them to do. And if, and if they're in a position to support, um, for even games I can't come to, obviously that would just make the student athlete experience all the better. But, you know, I think just a little bit of grace, um, you know, we're trying to, to make this all work. Um, we want to deliver for them. We know what our fans expect. They expect uh, us to win and they expect us to do it in a classy way. And, you know, that's what coach Grant, coach Green, myself, all our coaches plan to do. Um, but we're, we're going to have to fight through it together. Um, and, and clearly what they've, if they've done with the seating program to, 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 to still pay that and see what happens this season. We'll just uh, link arms and try and come out on the other side of this sooner rather than later. And, um, you know, we'll hopefully look back hopefully years from now and, and, and be you know, as strong as we were on that day um, in March when ESPN game day was here and when Sean is cutting down the nets and, and uh, Ryan, Mike, Sell, Obi Toppin and, and Trey Landers are doing a, a, a bow to the crowd of, of a sold out crowd. And that's our vision, and that's what we want to get back to as soon as possible. And the only way we can do that is, you know, we got to do our part, and then we just need our fans with us. And I'm, I'm confident we can get back to that uh, together. Man, those memories seem like yesterday, and yet they seem like a lifetime ago yeah. in many ways. Isn't that the truth? Yeah. I really haven't talked about it much, and so just even just even mention it on here, you're kind of like, dude, but, yeah. you know, we, we, we press on. We press yeah. on. Yeah. Well, Neil, I, I can't thank you enough for taking the time to uh, talk shop with me. I mean, I know you got just a ton on your plate and you're, you're distracted by all, all kinds of things that you probably never thought an athletic director would, would have to manage. But uh, I mean, I know you're on top of it. You do some in good hands and just your, your candidness and your thoughtfulness and transparency and all this stuff, UD related, um, certainly not lost on me and it's, it's not lost on the fan base. So on behalf of everybody who, who's watching, obviously everybody at UD Pride, I just want to tell you that uh, we're, we're thankful for your leadership and getting through this. Uh, we'll all get through it together and uh, just try to be safe out there and uh, take care and we'll talk again soon. Well, I appreciate the opportunity and, um, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll talk soon.